I would like to start this presentation with a caution and a special request. There's a very large amount of material in this presentation that is controversial. Please, focus on what you can agree with and park those things you cannot agree with for future consideration or discard them. I truly believe there is much of value in what follows and I urge you to focus on what is valuable to you. I'd like to acknowledge the input of Jonathan Gray. Uh, it was his material that triggered the thinking on which this presentation is based uh, and tied in with many areas of my experience which I'd seen very differently until I came across his material. Hi, I'm James Robertson. By training I'm a civil engineer. I have a bachelor's degree and a PhD in civil engineering specializing in geotechnical engineering. I have a number of years working experience in mining geotechnics and I've worked on a number of large mines uh, throughout southern Africa. I've been interested in geology all of my life and I grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm here to share with you some information which I'm really excited about. I happen also to be a believer in the Creator, Yah the eternally self-existing, and I happen to believe that the Bible is a reasonably reliable historical document. But I'm not here to tell you much about that right now. I want to show you some hard, rock hard, in fact, evidence that I regard as valuable and which I believe will help you to take a new view on the world you live in. I'm going to talk based on my environment, based on where I've spent the last 56 years of my life, give uh, or take a few uh, times out of the city and quite a lot of international travel. I'm going to share with you some information which in my mind absolutely definitively indicates that there was a worldwide global flood in which the entire planet was covered with water and the entire surface of the earth was massively destroyed and reshaped. And I'm going to do that with evidence that I can give you from my life experience with photographs taken in the home, my hometown and the immediate vicinity. So sit down, get yourself comfortable, and I want to take you on what I hope will be a really exciting ride. Here we go. As you may have picked up by training, I'm a civil engineer. For the last 21 years, I've been engaged in business advising large corporate clients on how to get the most value out of their computerized business information systems. In doing that, I've sought to bring, quote, the disciplines of engineering to the information technology industry. In applying that principle, I've come to do a lot of thinking about engineering and why it is that when engineers de design things, they generally work. And one of the things that I would suggest for your consideration, that you live in a space where bridges stand up. The interesting thing about that, though, is I came to the realization about 10 years ago that engineers do not design bridges to stand up. And you may recall this uh, bridge in Minneapolis, which collapsed in about 2008, killing 14 people and injuring 114. And it is so that the people who died that day drove onto that bridge with absolutely no expectation that their lives were in danger because it is so that bridges designed by engineers just do not fall down as part of our experience. And I came to understand that engineers do not design bridges to stand up they design bridges not to fall down. And there's a fundamental difference in approach in designing a bridge not to fall down. I would suggest that in formulating any view of history, in formulating any theory about the formation of the surface of the earth, that that theory should stand up to critical scrutiny. And in fact, that that theory should stand up and not fall down. And in order to ensure that your theory of topographic formation, your theory of the history of the earth does not fall down, you need to subject it 
to critical examination. So what is not an engineering approach? When I was young, I used to dream of standing on a chair in a crowded room and waving my arms and flying gently around the room talking to people. If you've never had an experience like that, maybe you should order that sort of dream. But if I was to stand on top of one of these buildings and jump off waving my arms shouting, I can fly, I could fly, I would almost certainly plummet to my death in a bloody mess. And so it's important that in formulating theories of the history of the earth that we do not resort to abstract philosophical debates uh, which are analogous to a magician conjuring a rabbit out of a hat. Our theories must be solid, they must be robust, they must stand up to scrutiny. In the work that I do as a business consultant and strategist, one of the things that I found 20 years ago was that I could not concisely define strategy. I came across the work of Professor Malcolm MacDonald, who says that strategy is doing the right things and that tactics is doing things right, and if you do the right things well, your organization will thrive. And I suggest for your consideration that any theory of the history of the earth, any theory of the history of the mountains and rivers and valleys that surround us should stand up to scrutiny in order for mankind to thrive. So what is strategy? The right things done right, the essence of why an organization exists and how it thrives, the essence of why a theory exists and how it supports humanity to thrive. In standing before you today, I do so with some credentials which I think are important in light of certain comments that were made to me when I first started to present these theories to people. I have a number of academic achievements, including a degree in a doc as a Doctor of Philosophy, uh, various awards that have come my way as a result of various work that I've done. and. Uh, so I would ask you to consider that I don't stand here without some uh, intellectual and academic background to support me. One of the principles that one learns as an engineer, and in fact one learns at school if one takes uh, mathematics, is a principle called reductio ad absurdum. It's a, an approach to proving theorems which says assume that the theorem is valid and work through all the necessary consequences of it being valid and see whether they in fact support the theorem. And if the outcome of assuming that the theorem is valid is absurd, then you have a proof by contradiction. Reductio ad absurdum is a widely acknowledged principle. You will find uh, at the time that I researched this presentation, 182,000 occurrences of that phrase on the internet. Uh, defined by Wikipedia, reductio ad absurdum, form of argument in which a proposition is disproven by following its implications to a logical but absurd consequence. And I will use reductio ad absurdum a number of times during this presentation, and I've applied it considerably in arriving at the conclusions that I present to you. Again, my point, what I have to share with you today has been carefully thought through and analyzed. Some other credentials in terms of my employment, my father's investment consultancy, specializing in South African gold shares. So when I talk about the gold mines of South Africa, I'm talking from a fundamental first principles understanding of the econ economics and mechanics of gold mining. International mining and geotechnical con consultancy, which took me to various mines around Southern Africa, and then my own uh, consultancy over the last 22 years in terms of the strategic application of information technology and critical thinking in business. Some other credentials. I'm a member of a number of uh, internationally recognized professional institutions and my point in sharing this with you is simply again uh, in order to become a member of these organizations one has to go through professional scrutiny. So I'm not standing up here without some basis to claim uh, what I'm talking to you about. My interest in geology goes back to my early childhood. One of my father's best friends was a mining engineer. I've been down a diversity of 
types of mine, both underground and open cast. I studied geology at university as part of my civil engineering degree. And my PhD relates to the use of cement stabilized soils for the construction of large dams, which included the manufacture of rock-like material through the application of pressure and cement. So when I talk to you about the formation of rocks, again, I speak from first-hand experience. Consulting with regard to mine geotechnics I've t spoken about already, and an ongoing interest in geology and topography as I travel around. And also, by the way, uh, at one stage in my life, I undertook quite a detailed study of ceramics. So when I speak to you about ceramic materials, again, I'm speaking from first-hand knowledge and experience. I've alluded to my mining experience uh, and just a few mines that I've been involved with, each one of which occurs with massive sedimentary deposits, which I will talk about in, in more detail later in this presentation. And so again, when I talk about the geology of Southern Africa, I do so from first-hand experience of having worked with the material. As I've mentioned, my PhD was undertaken into the use of cement stabilized soils for the construction of large dams, which involved uh, compressed and cemented soils converted into weak rock. Uh, various tests, including compressive strength, shear strength, permeability, leaching, and various other tests. You'll see some of the apparatus that I used on the right-hand side of the screen and the results of one of the tests at the bottom. Interestingly, while I was putting this presentation together, I went back to my PhD thesis and pulled out some samples of the uh, test results that occur. And what you will notice is that virtually every one of those test results follows an exponential curve, which is summarized by the red line in the middle at the bottom of, of the screen here. And, and you will see that even where there are portions of the characteristic which appear linear, subsequently as you go further down the curve or up the curve, uh, a nonlinear characteristic is experienced. This is fundamentally important to understanding what follows. It is a reality that in so-called nature, in the physical world, very, very few physical characteristics follow an ongoing linear trend. And in considering uh, some of the widely held theories that are prevalent with regard to topographic formation it is absolutely vital to keep this in mind. Most strength, decay, and other char characteristics are exponential. Change follows an exponential trajectory. The bed load and sediment load in water follows an exponential trajectory. Your car follows an exponential trajectory when you change direction. And it is so that extrapolation from the tail end of an exponential distribution, especially on the basis of linear assumptions, is highly inadvisable, as you will see by contrasting the blue line and the red line on the screen right now. Another fundamental engineering principle, extrapolation should be avoided, not something that you should do. And a search on Google turns up that... Uh, there are a huge number of instances, six, over 6 million web pages with those words on the same page, 965 page, uh, pages with the exact phrase, extrapolation should be avoided. Engineering principles say that you work by interpolation. You do not work by extrapolation. If you have to extrapolate, you extrapolate only incrementally, and then you confirm it in the laboratory or in some other form of testing. You do not extrapolate millions of times outside the domain of the available information. 